the new economy and information technology, the internet as a subject of the new economy. I'm Scott McLeod and it's July 6, 2007. The new economy does not equal the internet companies or dot-com companies. It's the economy of companies that work by, through, and around the internet. What used to be the industrial economy was previously based on electricity. Dot-com companies are just one example of the information technology company based on knowledge production and generation. The new economy. There are three interrelated factors which we'll look at. One, globalization. Two, how networks work. Uh, and three, the nature of information-based productivity. All of these are organized around digital electronic processes. And of course these work on information on the basis of information technology and are therefore microelectronics based. Productivity depends on knowledge generation and information processing in the new economy. Globalization. Globalization has two aspects here. One, dimensions of trade. So what happens in terms of globalization at the world level vis-a-vis -vis trade? And two, who is included and who is excluded and why? The microelectronics economic model. This works on an economic model based on information technology, which is based on microelectronics. Without the microelectronic economy, globalization would not exist. So the argument here is that it's not technology that creates society and a new economy, but society couldn't exist without it. Our society is therefore not produced by technology, but by all kinds of things. But without technology, the current form of socioeconomic organization could not exist. So technology did not create society, but society could not have been created without technology. Globalization. What does this mean? It's not just the international dimension. The 19th century was very global in a way. Uh, not global perhaps, but international. And even since the 16th century in the West, we've had a world empire. The Spanish with the Americas, the Caribbean, for example. There's been international trade for centuries now. But globalization is a very special kind of global economy. So globalization here refers to the worldwide movement of goods, information, capital, services, people, species, greenhouse gases, toxics, etc. on an unprecedented scope and scale and significantly influenced by information technology multinationals and the network society. The global economy is an economy with the capacity to work as a unit in real time on a planetary scale. There are three capacity types in the global economy. There's the technological capacity type. There's, secondly, the organizational capacity type. So the way firms retool to work locally and globally. And third, the institutional capacity type. So governments, for example, lift restrictions on movement to capital flows, increasing them to technology, etc. Real time. Real time means right here, right now. It's a sophisticated definition. Real or chosen time is time which one controls. On a planetary scale, it means that the unit is planetary, that one is everywhere. Things happen and they work as a unit that there is no American economy, no French economy, etc. That the unit is planetary. There are specific economic aspects in territories which shape this planetary scale. And the unit here means 
how things work, how they relate to the market, etc., which is global. Technical or technological capacity. This refers to not only information technology and the internet, but also telecommunications and air transportation, which statistically, all together, are one unit in the aggregate. They have the capability to move around millions and millions and millions of units. No one said globalization is great. Technical capacity means information systems have tolerable mistake rates. Organizational capacity. Organizational capacity refer, refers to firms that have retooled themselves so they can work both locally and globally. They have networks on the ground and in real time and they reorganize in order to shape these more efficiently and take advantage of these. Data shapes decisions in retooling organizational capacity. Institutional capacity. Institutional capacity means governments have lifted restrictions of movement to capital flows and increasingly to goods and services and technologies. Moving capital, money, labor like this is a recent phenomenon of the last 15 years or so due to three things liberalization, deregulation, and privatization. All of these helped globalization occur. Liberalization, deregulation, privatization. Liberalization means barriers to trade have been reduced. Deregulation means companies could do more or less what they wanted. Privatization means moving from public to private ownership. These major institutional changes are new and allowed globalization to occur. Deregulation, deregulation is absolutely critical to understanding these global processes. That's why globalization is new as of the last 20 years. It makes the unit become global we'll look at all of these dimensions. Production. Production is the easiest part to understand. It isn't the most important. Finance is. But production is the oldest form of globalization. It's organized worldwide by multinationals and their auxiliaries. This form of production, the assembly line for example, which affects the whole planet or is throughout the whole planet is based on the traditional model of effective industry from the 1980s. Production centers or prototype centers and research and development centers in this model are based in Silicon Valley. Large numbers of skilled workers around the world exist to uh, further the goals or the developments coming out of the prototype centers and research and development centers. But these large numbers of skilled workers around the world are not so skilled that you have to pay high wages, for example, to cover the housing costs of Silicon Valley in California. Workers don't need to be close to the core of research and development any longer in globalization vis-a-vis -vis the network society. For example, now there are assembly shops in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in India, in China. Production. Assembly plants work on the basis of cheap women labor, who are sometimes committed to factories by their parents. Testing is done close to main markets around the world, and the unit is planetary. Intel com Corporation, for example, does not think as a Silicon Valley company. Multinationals. Multinational corporations are only part of the story.
they only employ a fraction of the worldwide of worldwide labor uh, about 150 million workers out of a three billion strong workforce in 2000 worldwide 60 percent of world labor is in agriculture less than 10 percent of the remainder work for technology firms that's a gross estimate this percentage less than 10 percent accounts for or accounted for 40 percent of GDP gross domestic product or two-thirds of international trade around 2000 the year 2000 which means that this determines a lot of everything else everywhere internationalization of production the internationalization of work in relation to the production system is uh, which is globalized creates production and economic specialization by place the idea is to locate every different function in this new production system in an area best suited for that particular operation so companies ask where is labor cheaper? Thailand, Hong Kong, the Congo? And concerning the Congo, for example, a corporation might ask, would you locate in the Congo? Like California in 2001, with blackouts thanks to the Enron debacle, there isn't regular electricity in the Congo. It's a depressed situation before locating in a new place to make cheap computers, companies make sure that infrastructure conditions are met. Some companies locate in Silicon Valley to look for talent, which comes from all over the world from great universities because Silicon Valley in California attracts talent. So production systems are articulated internationally. Silicon Valley and multinational corporations. Where companies are located more or less in the year 2000 accounted for two-thirds of the international trade linked to this multinational system. And 45% of global trade is located in Silicon Valley or in related networks. And intra-company trade between companies is the most substantial part of this trade multinationals. How many multinationals are there? In the year 2000 there were 53,600 multinational corporations with 416,000 subsidiaries. Not a lot in terms of the numbers of people on the globe, but it's like a huge guy in a room. They have a lot of sway. Multinational corporate system, the multinational corporate system is made up of a number of businesses around the world. For example, Nokia, a Finnish company, owns 36 or owned 36 percent of the international mobile phone market and has 39 managed service contracts in 30 countries. Multinationals, all the top management around the world have, however, nationally rooted companies. It's not that multinationals don't have strongly rooted identities, but when in Singapore, a multinational company has to fly the Singaporean flag. Multinationals as mercenaries. Transnationals, those companies which have, uh, or uh, business uh, folks who have no nationality, are mercenaries. But they aren't pure mercenaries. They have a kind of schizophrenic relationship with the countries they do business in. They do business sincerely in many countries. So within this new system of globalization and change of production, the end of nationality does not occur. But the globalization of production multinationalization does occur. Foreign direct investment occurs. For example, Sony buys an American company and then has exploded in the last 10 to 20 years in terms of growth rate. 
mergers and acquisitions. They're very important. For example, Sony decides to go into media and doesn't create any new products, but buys Hollywood. Mergers and acquisitions mean buying companies. Only one major company exists in Puerto Rico. A key form of direct investment is acquisitions and mergers. For example, vis-a-vis -vis the internet, Telefonica in Spain bought Lycos and merged Telefonica with Lycos to make a better telecom. Recap. So foreign direct investment has exploded in the last 10 to 20 years. Mergers and acquisitions have been key. Production has become global and organized around core global companies. Trade has gone up substantially in relation to gross domestic product. Continuing this recap, if one looks at the proportion of world trade, the proportion of world exports to GDP, this is substantially increased from 11% in 1912 to 22% in 1998. More and more countries depend on what they sell around the globe. The internationalization of trade is significant only a few companies export and do not import, but most export. Countries in fast areas of growth, Pacific Asia for example, use export strategies like the one China does. They export more than they import. The ability to export more is called competitiveness. And competitiveness is created by producing something better than everybody else, or producing something cheaper. Free trade argument. There's an idealized idea that the world is increasingly open to trade for the good of everybody. Within a globalization debate, if the market is open, classical economic theory argues that all will benefit, that inefficiencies will lessen, and all will become richer. But is that the case? If you compete, for example, if Brazil replaces United States shoemakers, it's good for American consumers, and it's good for the Brazilian shoemaking industry. U.S. shoemakers then learn computer design and sell this to Brazil for profit. If not, friction occurs. So the assumption is that openness of trade benefits everyone, that expansion is the key. This leads to greater benefits for labor and bigger markets. In one sense, most of this international trade involves trade within one multinational system. But this isn't what one sees in the newspaper. One often sees a perspective that privileges certain countries, certain regions, certain areas. Services and multinationals. What happens if one looks at trade in services between this and this and this place and that place? Trading services is more difficult than trading production. And trading services is cheaper. It's difficult to trade health and education. In the United States, about 74% of employment is in services. But services are only 20% of world trade. Most services are not internationally tradable. Multinational production. Multinational production affects international trade, which ideally leads to higher 
employment and higher income, which leads to greater services, which leads back to higher employment and higher income. So how does multinational production affect services? Why does this series of relationships lead to higher services? Well, if you have higher, higher income and more employment, there is more money, therefore more services. Therefore, higher income leads to more services and thus higher employment. The OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, are, is made up of uh, the country club of countries and in terms of export over exports over total world exports in manufacturing OECD countries make up 80 percent in volume not value and in terms of services OECD countries make up 70 percent overall in terms of value the heart of the matter is that the bulk of exports is from industrialized countries to industrialized countries, those in the OECD. And by the year 2000, OECD co economies had 71% of world's the world's total exports and goods. It's a highly asymmetrical system. And the trend has favored uh, these countries as well. OECD and developing countries. Uh, the trend has also favored developing countries gaining significance because they start at low levels. In 1965, the share of developing countries um, in terms of world domestic product was 6%. In 2000, it's about 20%. Still, developed countries make up 80% of the trade. OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, these countries, vis-a-vis -vis globalization, yes, globalization is occurring, but not from everywhere to everywhere. This occurs only from time to time. Formerly, developing countries grow by joining the OECD. Conclusion. Science and technology are extremely important. They offer a source of knowledge and they offer the capacity to innovate. If you have money and no knowledge, you'll lose money. If you have knowledge, you get money. Knowledge leads to finding money. Science and technology are global. In principle, you have a global system of exchanging documents. And technology is key. Global science and technology. In principle, you have a global system of exchanging documents, and technology is key here. It's both private and public, and labor is imported. There are networks of research and development centers. OECD research and development and networks. Overall, 90% of technology research and innovation is located in OECD countries. Networks are very dense in these countries. It's a system of cooperation. For example, Bangalore, India, India is not an OECD member, is part of R&D departments of multinational corporations. Innovation and education. In the mid-1990s, 10 countries accounted for 84% of global research and, and spending and controlled 95% of technological patents. In the U.S., on the one hand, the U.S. university system is an extraordinarily open system. 50% of graduate students are foreigners. However, 50% of these foreigners stay in the United States. Education here equals innovation. They feed back on one another technological innovation. Overall, 90% of technological resources in innovation and research are located in OECD countries, as I said. 
There are huge concentrations in these systems. They connect to even isolated networks, bringing them to the center. One important aspect, generating knowledge, occurs between these research centers. Professor Anne Saxanian at Berkeley studied immigrant entrepreneurs from Taiwan, India, China, etc. vis-a-vis technology. In the 1990s, 30 percent of new companies started were headed by Chinese and Indian entrepreneurs in the United States. Is there a brain drain from these countries was one key question she is asking. Brain drain. The large majority of these people studied at American universities. They work in a Silicon Valley high-tech company. They start their own company. They get a green card. They go back to the country to start a company there. And they establish bridging networks of innovation and technology. So Saxanian's work suggests that there's a brain circulation and not a brain drain which is occurring. Science and technology are globalized in specific ways. Anne Saxanian looks at these questions in The New Argonauts. Labor is least globalized. In principle, if the economy is global, labor should also be global. But countries still have borders, national feelings, and xenophobia. The notion that people can work anywhere is foreign. This creates barriers for labor. Globalization and labor. Globalization allows countries to lift barriers. For some, those who will accept lower working conditions can come. Uh, flow between countries is relatively controlled for a while, then borders open with special quotas to let people immigrate. The U.S., for example, has a labor market for highly skilled individuals, which is absolutely globalized. That is semi-global. Professional skills are globalized. Athletes are an example of highly skilled labor that is global. High, high skills are needed. They are professional laborers and they have special skills. Unskilled labor is not global and there are 160 million migrant strong labor force. In comparison with 1.4 billion a 1.4 billion labor force 160 million uh, strong migrant labor force is small foreign immigrants in Europe are rapidly increasing immigration is concentrated in a few countries one-third 40 percent of migrants in the world are in one region in the world that is in Africa which is the most migrant country.